So again, this I want, we all know this, that even without internet, we have to worry about in the LAN itself, spoofing IP addresses, wrong address, wireless access, anybody can come, stat what is the static MAC IP mapping? This is important. So you are in the hostel, 6, 10.6. So one solution is to allow them to use any address, 10.6 point x point y, from their room. Is that a good or a bad thing? Bad thing, because he can make it look like his friend's PC caused that attack. So in this room, if he's using a PC, the wire has to come. In that wire, the switch can be told, do not accept any packets which are masqueraded. Have you seen uh, software or you asked to use software which will fake a MAC address, which will fake an IP address? So your, all these packets are software, right, <laughs> generated. What you put as the address, what you put as the thing is in the control of the kernel level software. And tools are available to make your machine send out a packet whose MAC address is some other thing, whose IP address is some other thing. Now, one level, one sensible defense will be that at the very first point, where is the very first point this can be detected and blocked? The switch connecting that hostel room, the lowest leaf, the hostel room has a connection. That switch, if you buy a very old and day cheapest switch with no control, then you are in trouble, you have to do it at the next level. But today, almost every switch, even at that level, affordable switches have what is called static MAC IP binding. That on this port, only this MAC can be used and only this IP can be used at that switch port. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? From security perspective, it's a good thing. From administration perspective, why is it a bad thing? Now he buys a new machine, he changes the network card. So is there a via media? So I'm not going to give you the answer. Because for security, if you make everything a nightmare, that one solution is this, that you should fill and triplicate the new IP, the new Mac, okay, and you should submit one application to the hostel warden, one to the main building, one to the director's office, and then the signatures will be taken, and after two months, he'll be told, use this IP. And all these papers will be filed for 10 years. Everybody in triplicate is giving paper application. Is that the way? That is the way of the Indian economy long back. It seems, again, this is a... Sorry, uh, but last joke, I won't crack jokes anymore. Nehru was asked, why are you doing this? Why are you asking people to submit forms in you know, triplicate to different places? He said, how, will else, how else will I employ so many people? Government has to employ people, right? <laughs> so he was trying to do job creation instead of giving service delivery. So if CC says security is an issue, therefore, CC means computer center. Then what will happen? CC will be the most disliked unit in the campus. And do you want to be disliked? <laughs> you are the CISAD now, right? I told you to think you are a CISAD. Do you want to be disliked by your users? No. So what is the via media? LDAP. A user can online make a request. Software can be written that if he tries with a new IP, he will be redirected to a website, which will say, are you this user? Log in, give your credentials, approval will be done. Sometimes approval is automatic. And then monitoring of that port happens for the next three days, something unusual, we block it. Think very sophisticated solutions can be done, which makes it a matter of provided there is a centralized authentication system. All of, us, all of us have that, right? LDAP, we need that. Students need that. Faculty need that. So I just did it. I don't know how many of you came early enough. To use internet from this room, I had to give my LDAP ID. If you have now a mobile phone with a smart, you might get into the wireless. Even that, you need a name and password. Beyond that also you need a name and password. Why do you need that? Same reason. Okay, but if I have the name and password, I shouldn't have to fill three forms. So I can go anywhere in campus with this laptop and connect and get redirected and similarly they can do. But it gives control. It is recorded. Anomalies are detected. If somebody is changing his IP address 10 times in the two, two weeks, flag goes up. SMS, alerts, emails, sysads, hostel sysad is asked to explain. Check is done. It is not enough to put all these mechanisms in place. What is more important? It is not enough to have power. You must show that power. 
Once a week, you must go and actually ask a student why he did it. Then what is the message that you have sent? You know it is, you know it is not a wrong thing, yet you go and ask why? To demonstrate to them that you have the ability to find out. If you cannot demonstrate the power, sorry, okay, I don't want to talk like, but this is important. Huh? All I'm telling you is technical is 70% of the solution. The remaining, the most important 30% is thinking through your strat response, how you react, how you project. That CC knows, that the head CC knows, director will know. So once the students know that you know, then the behavior is very different than, suppose you put a video camera, the number of banana skins that are thrown in the mess here and there will reduce. Nobody needs to see the video, okay, the video can be dev null. But the very fact that it can be seen and you can be seen throwing this and it can be used to name and shame you, should you do it or not, don't ask me, okay. That's a different issue, all I'm saying is that do not just think solutions are out of the box. Like I said, not push button. Everything has to have a policy, everything has to have a buy-in. Buy-in means what? Students should know this is the policy. They should be told why they are being asked. It is not arbitrary ad hoc exercise of power. It is something which will keep the whole system hygiene. It's normal hygiene. So that is what this lecture is about. I hope I, even if I cannot communicate all the technical parts, I want that 30% to be something which you all agree, that if you are going to make your campus network secure, you have to think through beforehand the policies, the what your information you need, why you need it, tell the users, have it written down, have it agreed and execute it, okay? Not arbitrary. So this is what is the thing, good land design. So again, I'm just naming some of the software. Some of this has upgraded now. DJB DNS was five, six years back. Now it's tiny DNS, something to run our name server. Then open LDAP is we still use, CLAM antivirus we use, firewall squid is one of the best uh, uh, proxy softwares. Email, Qmail has given way to Postfix today. Okay, news groups, web proxy, Apache's our web server and so on. So this is something now I can go a little faster because I've already told you most of this, that we have many subnets, we have so many nodes, all private ad addresses. It is not four WAN subnets now, there are three WAN links now, I'll show you the next. And IP tables is the focus of the next 10 minutes. That I want to now control who out of these 5,000 users can do what. Can I set up a web server in my hostel and publish the URL to the whole world so that somebody can see www.h6.itb.ac.in? It's not automatic to do that. We need to have a policy, a method and all that. And for that we have to change our IP tables rules. What you said, that it should result to the same IP and that IP should be a firewall natting or a virtual host reverse proxying and that permissions and policies have to be in place. And we need many policies, which servers should be allowed, people can access from outside, which serve, from inside which you can go to, what you can go to and all that. And the last bullet is why I spent the last five minutes. That if you don't make a good policy and if the policy is not having the buy-in from the users, it is unlikely to work. It is despite the best tools. Okay, so we should do both. So IP tables is the next 10, 15 minutes. It's an important component. Again, I do not expect that you should understand IP tables fully at the end. Even more important, you should not understand IP tables because the next one is already on the way. It's called net tables, NF tables. Net filter is the bigger project. And IP tables has made a mark for itself as a free open source state full firewall doing many interesting things. But IP tables is too complex and its design is not the best in terms of performance also. So its successor, which is compatible with IP tables is already on the way, January 2014. So those who do not want to learn old technology can directly go to, if you have not seen IP tables before, go directly to NF tables, okay? But it's not too hard. It's not like rocket science or anything, but let's just stay with IP tables. It's an implementation of firewall in Linux. It is a packet filtering route. It's called net filter and all that. And it can filter on many parts of the packet. The Wireshark you saw, no? There are many different parts of the packet. We can configure it to allow, disallow, rate limit, and so many good things. And it has protect, regulate traffic, and it can provide screening the packets and so on. More important, it can log. What is log? The second part I said, right? 
you want to know if some somebody from China is scanning your network. You want to know if somebody is from the hostel is trying something else from the internal firewall. Log means what? Write that information somewhere. You know, no, it's not enough to stop. If the security guard at IIT Bombay's gate is seeing, you know, every day hundreds of certain type of you know uh, uh, suspicious persons coming and he's uh, turning them away and he's doing this every day and keeps quiet. Is that good? What is the next step? It's called escalation. He has to report it to somebody. Somebody has to say why. Find out. You don't want to keep doing this every day. You want to find out why that is happening and prevent it. Right? That is what the logging means. And IP tables allows you to log. If you log everything, please remember how much data, how many packets. So IP tables allows this intelligent. If you match a particular pattern, that's what is meant there, pull matching. Only the events of interest I want to log. I don't want to log things that say, this fellow came, uh, Google sent a mail, yeah, Gmail sent a mail, Gmail sent a 10 MB mail, it had 5,000 packet, all that I don't want. So suspicious. What is suspicious? How to classify that? How to put those filters? All that is again possible. Full control with the user. So basically IP tables works this way, that we have a rule chain and when a packet comes on one interface, IP tables can work even on a single machine, single desktop with a single card. When a packet comes, we can still block it. If somebody is trying to do bad things to our computer, I am not a router. So it is similarly packets leaving also I can block. Why should I block packets leaving? If a botnet, a bot has infected my computer, what will it try to do? It will try to connect to some vague IP on some vague port so that it can get its commands and then do damage. It normally won't do damage to me. Why will it not do damage to me? It's like a parasite. If the host dies, the parasite also dies. So the host should not die. Okay. But it'll, the channel without my knowledge, if it is trying to establish connections back, including MS exchange, then I need to be able to using IP tables block it and not allow it, even for a single machine. But here we are going to look at routers. Okay. And every packet is matched from the top with all the rules. The first rule that matches, its action will be taken. And suppose the action says over, then over, otherwise next rule, next rule like that. So there are different types of actions. The action is simply log, then it's not over. Then you have to continue. Something suspicious, log it and continue. But if it's something reject, reject, don't continue. So there are many rules we can write for processing a packet and the rules are straight from the top. Okay? This is where the complexity comes. People write the rules in the wrong order and it doesn't work the way they want. Okay? So the next, the three functionalities that is very important is, and I'll explain this, not the uh, second half of packet mangling. What is destination NAT? So I want to send the packet out after changing the destination IP. Give me an example of when that will happen. The website we host that I said. That fellow is sending HTTP request. I am not the server. So he sends with my address as the destination. I change it to CSC server's address and send it inside. When the reply comes, this is the state that I have to maintain. I have to keep that information. For whom I did what change? On which port? And when the reply comes, I have to put it back. What is source natting? When I send from my browser a request to atlas.arbor or whatever, mine is 10.0, 10.5, 10 point something. I can't send this packet out. So that guy has to change it to his public IP, send it. When the reply comes, change it back. That is source netting. And the third one is connection tracking. That if you keep doing this for every packet, no. But if you know this is part of an existing TCP connection, how do you identify TCP connection? Source IP, destination IP, source port, destination port. So if in your tables this connection is already on, then I don't have to check the rules all over again. I just follow what I was doing. So the table says it is still alive, states and expectations. So we can do interesting things. And this again is important in some sense, but maybe after this I will like not explain less. But this, uh, there are many more slides, but this is what I'll explain. This is your computer. 
and your computer can either receive packets from the network or send packets to the network. Okay? So the local process in my computer, it can be a HTTP process, it can be a mail process, can send a packet. So which chain of rules is used? Output chain. The process on my computer is sending a packet and it has to go to internet. Then I use the rules which are called output chain rules. The forward chain rules is that I am getting a packet on the network. Look at the top, a packet is coming to me. I have to decide is that packet for an application on my OS, is the packet for my IP. If it is, that should go to the input chain, whether it should be given to my HTTP process. If it is not for my IP, then I should go to routing. That means I may be acting like a router, like the internal firewall or the residential net firewall. So the packets are not for me. The packet is coming from uh, Shiva's house and it's going to CSA department. So I have to decide whether to forward or not. And I can now configure that Shiva's house can only talk to CSA department. If I try to connect EE department, packet will be dropped. In the forward chain, I can put rules. Source address 10.161 can only reach destination 10.105. So if I try to reach any other destination, why would you do that? If you don't like faculty and don't want to give them a lot of access, configure it in a very default deny. Give them only the minimum. They, why do you want uh, internet at home? They'll say, I want to go to Google. So give them only Google. <laughs> what is this policy called? I'm going to explain that. So this is what is called policy. See, policy, 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 that will keep coming. So you understood the three tables, that when you set up IP tables on any machine, there are three tables. One is the output chain rules for packets originating from that machine and going out. Next is input chain rules for packet coming to that machine. Third one is forward. Now if you are a single machine, you want forward. But if you are having multiple cards, then you may act like a router. Take packets from here, put it there, take packets from there. Routers use the forward chain. Okay, and then there's pre-routing, post-routing. Some decisions are made before routing, some decisions are made after routing, not all that, okay? So the example is here, I said, that if from home I try to connect to EE department, the forward rules can say drop it, minus J reject. That means no more rules will be used. I can explicitly reject. I can explicitly accept. If it is going to the right IP, of course you don't want to put so many rules. For every pair you don't want to put. Okay, you want to use wildcards, regular expressions, patterns, and so I'm just explaining. You can accept the packet and send it further. So this is what is important, that when you do that, first you have to do, enable the forwarding, if you are acting as a router, and then you have to flush all the rules. And then, this is important, that if you are acting as a router and you are having two cards, then you have to give what is called a default policy. What is the last rule? First rule, second rule, third rule, fourth rule, fifth rule. None of the rules apply, then what should I do? So default can be? So this is, forget IP tables. In general, default accept or default deny, which is good. Default deny if you want to be very secure. Default accept if you want to provide services. That block only the bad guys is default accept. I know what is bad, I will block it. But if you don't know what all is bad, something else could be bad. If I say I know what is good, I will allow only the good, then it is default deny. If you will block only the bad, is default accept. So neither one is the best, but the safer policy is default deny. Just deny. That if you don't know and it's unknown connection, unknown packet, drop it. You are safer. But you may be causing inconvenience to the users. Okay, it may be a harmless. So that is policy. So let me now go a little bit faster in the interest of time that you can do source netting like this. So you don't have to do all these lines in the command line. I have typed it in the command line, minus t nat post routing ethernet zero, if the source is this source nat to, this is my residential address, you change the source to department address and so on and so forth. So that the reply can come. When I try to connect to my department server, 10.1.5, it should know how to reply. So it may not have root to this other subnet, so I do natting, okay. So this type of rules can be put in a file, can be put in the right order and the rules can be read in a batch. And there are front ends to make these rules. What are the front ends? You click, you, dot, you put IP, put, 
then the rule is generated for you. So those front ends are not something you should learn right now. Okay, right now in the lab and so on, and when you do the experiment when you go home, you should actually try out the syntax, read the pages. Later on, use all those easy tools, okay, which will act as pre-processor and post-processor. So this one says, accept all established connections, and again, let me skip this. You can allow HTTP, you can allow SSH, you can, all other protocols you can drop. And in this page, I want you to focus on the last rule. This is important. So the protocol is TCP, and what is this? Sin means what? Sin flag is set means what? It's trying to establish a new connection, yes? And what does this say? Minus limit. So it could have been one per second, okay, or two per minute. What is the, what are we trying to say? That if somebody is trying to connect to my server, do not allow more than 10 per second. Why 10 per second? Even email, no? I told you 50,000 mails, you can do the arithmetic and so on. 6 lakh mails, then how many per minute, how many per hour, how many per second. So you don't want to be blocking unnecessarily. You don't want, you have to calculate that number and adjust it, depending on what is allowed. And if it is not critical services like mail and so on, you can afford to be very, you know, one per minute is enough. If a student is wanting to see some page, why should he see it more than once a minute? Okay, so you can choose. But this is called rate limiting. And why is it important? It makes attack much harder. Denial of service attack in the first place. Okay. Half open connections, do you know? I send a sin, I don't send the ACK, I don't send the again the ACK. That means the other machine is using some resources to process my connection. So again, so this is what IP tables, I hope you got a brief flavor that we can take a machine and we can achieve, allow only some services, allow new connections only from some places, allow TCP, you can use sports scans, scans, spoofs. I can't from my house fake the IP and send an IP, which is some other department IP, because the firewall will drop it, okay? So spoofing, everything is reduced. If you are able to segment your network, and in the routers, and this is strongly encouraged in your campus. I am not saying don't buy commercial routers. You don't need is all I am saying. You can use a normal Linux box with two gigabit ethernet cards, and it will perform like this, okay? And you can configure IP tables much more flexibly. Commercial products also are there, boxes like this, which also have IP tables where you can go and similar rules you can set up. So when we teach students, we are not going to teach them only IP tables. It's just firewall with source NAT, destination NAT, rate control limiting, and most firewalls support features like this. So this is how we bring in some level of security. And the last slide on IP tables is simply to tell you that DNS queries for IIT Bombay, which are coming from outside, come on the UDP port, destination port 53, or TCP port, and we NAT it, send it to the internal server, allow the responses to go back, so that people outside can resolve IP addresses. We internally use only, even in the demilitarized zone, we use only 10 dot addresses. The 101 or the public IP addresses are used only in the firewall, external firewall. So we have full control over, full control, unless IP tables itself has a bug and so on and so forth. And we have a little bit more confidence that only what we want is coming, what we don't want is not coming. Now similarly, and I think I will probably go a little faster on this, how we receive mail. I just want to say one important thing for outgoing mail. So this is important. Again, I'm not going to say how you fix it. What's an open relay? If I'm a spammer and I want to send a phishing email, where do I want to send it from? So not my own account, okay? If I can find a mail server which is wrongly configured, which acts as a relay, that I connect to IIT Bombay's mail server and ask it to send mail to Gmail. IIT Bombay's mail server should never do that, right? Why? Why should you allow somebody in Germany to send mail to you and then pass it to Gmail? Because then he can fake his source IP and Gmail will think it came from IIT Bombay. And forget Gmail, some US government, White House. So when they, in their logs, the mail has come from us. So they will now investigate here. We can, of course, later on prove that we are not guilty or so on and so forth, but it becomes one more level of safety for him. And open relay is doing no good for you. 
So you have to make sure that your mail is not being misused by spammers. And this is even more important. This is something very few people do. It has a slight negative, but the advantages outweigh the disadvantage. This is called sender policy framework that my, what is my email ID? Siva at iitb.ac.in. Suppose somebody in the US is using this in his, as his from. Can you do that in your mail client? Can you put any from ID? You all use email, no? Let me tell you, you can, okay? You can say from Siva at IIT, you, you are not Siva, you are sitting in America, you are a student in a university there, Purdue University, and you say from Siva at IIT, you can use the basic SMTP protocol, telnet, this thing, okay, and you can. Now, if our domain has sent the sender policy framework, and the receiver is noticing this, that in our MX records, we say, please use sender policy. Sender policy is that iitb.email, any email which claims to be from the domain iitb.ac.in can only come from these three addresses, which is our mail relay. So even if I'm abroad and I want to send mail, I must use our mail relay and send mail if I want to use the address. Otherwise, the other fellow will drop it. He'll say, this is a spam mail, this is a fake mail. Okay. So don't worry, just go and search for this SPF, Center Policy Framework. You will learn a little bit more. That those who want their email to protect their users from your email ID being misused by others outside, then you can set this up. Okay, so now the last part, the R syslog. So I gave a flavor of IP tables, flavor of how to set up services, how to be secure. Now what I said, it is not enough to set it up. Na kupa kanam yuktam pradipte vanni na grihe. When your house is burning, then you don't go and dig a well. You run. <laughs> okay. When do you dig a well? Beforehand. You, uh, it's not a joke. The fire department refused to give permission for the faculty flat. 60 flats were ready in October. And people could move in only in May because they came and inspected and they found that there is no water source in case there is a fire. They insisted that you go nearby, make this underground tank, have a facility to fill it and check it, then only they gave clearance for occupation. Exactly what this Sanskrit poem is saying. Okay. Similarly, when you set up all these services, if I were director of IIT Bombay, and I hope I never become, <laughs> then <laughs> I would not allow us to do mail unless the sysad tells me that he has this log analysis, that he knows how many mails are coming, how many mails are going, that he can find out. If, he's, if he does not give me the guarantee, I'll say don't do mail. Why I will say don't do mail? Because I don't want CBI to come here and say that one of your students sent a threat mail to Obama and therefore he should be arrested. It is my responsibility that my student should not be arrested. Therefore, I should also take due diligence to ensure that these things are not easy for him to do and if he does it beyond that, then he deserves let him be arrested. So if these precautionary measures are not in place, I am as much to blame as the student. That is the role I think some of us take. We are not so anti-student, so we try to make it harder for them to may do crimes. So that is what this is. That security should not be an afterthought, and therefore in the next five minutes, let me tell you that you should build what is called centralized log management. So IIT Bombay's motto is, Jnanam, have you seen in that arch? Jnanam Paramam Dhyayam. What does it mean? Knowledge is supreme. So in different contexts, it's interpreted differently. It cannot be stolen. Thieves cannot do it. Your brother will not ask for a hereditary share. Okay. <laughs> Give me 50%. My father's knowledge should come to me. Like that, it doesn't come. Okay. So knowledge is by, you have to learn, you have to do, but it cannot be. So it is important. And here, what is knowledge in this context? What I said, information about what is happening on your network. And I just randomly wrote some questions. So if you are the sysad and wearing the sysad hat, you must answer this. How much traffic came? Anything abnormal? How many emails came? What are the top 10 senders? Is anyone trying to spam from China, Pakistan? How much bandwidth is used for browsing? What are the top domains my students are browsing? If I were a director, I'll simply ask these questions. Do I need to know anything about IP tables, R, syslog, nothing? I should just call the sysad once a month and say, please tell me all this. Tell me tomorrow morning. If you cannot, please find another sysad or give him assistance, give him help, okay? So it depends because today you can't find suicides. Huh? Tomorrow or actually today, how many of you are aware is our MTech admissions for the three-year MTech, what, called RAs. You know about that? 
there are some who get directly through gate in the two year program and there is this today is a big mela about 200 students who are just below in the gate cutoff they are called for an interview and 20 of them will be appointed as RAs and many of them 10 of them will become CISADs for the next three years. First year will be on the job training by their seniors, second year and third year some of the TAs are in the lab for you in the afternoon I mean in not today afternoon is lectures. They are going to set up and help us administer the network. So that I can tell you for IIT Bombay that model works. That trust some of the senior students, give them some power with some accountability and allow them to do whatever I am going to say. And they help the CISAD to answer all these questions regularly. Now this is only step one. If you answer tomorrow, I will give you a pass mark 40 out of 100. When will I give you an A plus? You react when the thing happens. An SMS comes to you, you are just sitting nicely enjoying coffee. You are not clicking, clicking, clicking. That is not good work, that is not smart work. Go to that click watch, go to that click watch. That is not a smart suicide. What is a smart suicide? Usually drinking coffee, suddenly an SMS comes. That server is being attacked. He reacts. Okay? So that is where we want to go. That is the OSSEC in tomorrow's lab. That we set up the system so that they trigger these alerts whenever they notice a suspicion. Now, if alerts like this come five times a day and only one of them is serious, it's not wrong. Okay, the other four I can ignore, but I need those alerts. So it's called false positives. Some false positives will be there. It's better to be safe than sorry. So today, right now in the next few minutes, I'll only show some static reports. That at least keep your logs, analyze them and learn something from them. But the dynamic reports is much harder and that could be the scope for further work and further studies and so on and so forth. So again, I'm just naming some software that we use. I'll show some more details. How is the network doing? We use MRTG and smoke ping and so on. Our services up, we use some software called Negios. All of these are open source, free, installable by you and so on. Then log analysis tools and so on, I'll show you some of that. So here is some information about IITB WAN links. Vodafone 650 Mbps. I told you in the introductory remark, we had 64 kbps. So 650 Mbps means what? One of our WAN links is 10,000 times more bandwidth than what we had. So Professor Deepan Ghosh uh, was a physics professor who was head of computer center. He took us from 64 kbps to 2 mbps. And then when I was head of computer center, it became from 2 to 16. He said, you have done only eight times. Look, look at what I did. You cannot match me, <laughs> okay? <laughs> it's like Newton and Ramanujam. All the easy stuff they did and got all the awards. Okay, now we have to do much harder work to become famous. So this is like 1 gbps NKN. What is the usage? Is this enough just to see the graph? This is yesterday's graph. I can show you live also, but I don't want to waste time. You can have a daily graph. And for those who can't see, when is the maximum traffic? Just before midnight. Why does it fall at midnight? Our hostels, we disable the LAN at midnight for five hours. Why do we disable the LAN? So that they can sleep and come to class. Do they come to class? No. All that you ask me in open session. But uh, they find ways around and all that. But still, it pattern is predictable. And that is happening every day. Midnight, tada, it will drop. And that will happen if you see the weekly graph, if you see the monthly graph. Now seeing this graph and trying to see anomaly is very difficult, right? A microscope put up. <laughs> That's not the way. So it has some software should be seeing this, not us. But seeing this gives us some comfort, you know, some major problems can be viewed. And you can see the monthly graph also, yearly graph. However much bandwidth you have, usage expands to fill it. So this is one of the links, 650 Mbps, what is, what is coming? So if I'm director, I'm going to ask, why is the, what is the blue line and green line? What is the blue line? How much data is going out of IIT Bombay? Can you see it is remaining very low? Why is it very low? So if I'm director and I'm shown this graph, I'll ask the set first this question, what is green, what is blue? So you'll say green is data coming into IIT, blue is data going out of IIT. So what will I say? Why nobody wants our data? My faculty are not publishing papers. There are no videos here. How many of you have come to IIT Bombay website before? How many of you have gone to MIT? So he'll say, show me the comparison. <laughs> yes? 
director only has to ask questions, right? He's only a director. He doesn't have to do anything. <laughs> I hope he's not listening. Anyway. <laughs> So this is the sort of just getting this information and showing it allows many people from different perspectives to ask different questions. And asking questions is important. Hiding is not a good policy at all. You can remain head of the computer center with everybody cursing you, or you can make this information public and get cost the improvement and show the curve and show and tell I know who is using, I know why it has gone up, I know what is coming in, I know how our students are benefiting. This is something that you have to do, accountability. Why are you paying so much for this bandwidth? Can I cut down the bandwidth to half? Okay, all that can only come if, this is next quickly, Nagios. So there is this one which will monitor, is my mail server up, is my web server up, is this up, is that up and so on, that is called Nagios. And red light means something is wrong. But still I have to see it. If I don't see the screen, then Nagios is configured to send mail, then I have to read the mail. Now Nagios can be configured to send an SMS. Why SMS is better? Because usually our mobile spim, some sound comes, then we look at it, SMS, okay. So that is how you should configure. It's just watching, are the services up, is everything okay? If something seems abnormal, it will send you that, alerts. Then this is January 2003 mail statistics. I use some software then, now I'm using in your lab, tomorrow you'll use a different software called PF log summary, postfix log summary. And it'll give you information like this, that uh, 34,000 mails came, 534 MB, outgoing was 17,000 mails, and even here, even as a human, you can see and you can verify this, 27, 21, seven days later, 28, 23. Seven days later, weekends were slightly less number of mails going out, people were not working. So it sort of validates common sense reasoning. But I want more. I want to know who were the top 25 senders, who they said this, I can show you all this because it's 2003. So the uh, RTI information, I mean privacy laws hopefully no longer hold or probably the students have left. So they won't sue me, okay? That fellow sends this many mails, this much volume. So you must first, this is the first level of analysis. What is the second level? That another script should run, and if anybody sends more than 100 mails, you should get a polite mail. If it is academic usage, please continue, otherwise please stop. This is an automated mail. If this happens 10 times, then the head CC will be asked to look into it. That's all the mail says. So if you're a genuine user, will you worry about this mail, will you complain? You will just ignore it. If you're a bad user, I told you that, no. It is not enough to know, you must show that you know. So the bad user one day sends 500 mails, nothing happens, next day he gets this polite love letter. <laughs> then what does he do? Hopefully most of them will reduce. Then you can tackle the hard cases. The hardened criminals can be tackled once you have so clear, that is what is the next step. That is what AW stats in tomorrow's lab you will do. Real time monitoring analysis, sending the warning, sending this thing. Mail server statistics, how many this thing viruses and so on and so forth. How much scans, what mails, the red is the virus count and all that. So you can do all that. Similarly, web proxy, who came to our site, from where they came, which pages they saw, which country they came from. And the top seems to be unknown. Next is US commercial, then network, then US educational, then India, then Canada. So you can try to find out who is coming to my site, why they are coming. So if you are PRO of IIT Bombay, you would like to know this. Is the press coming? Can I find out? So they'll ask the suicide, find out if press is coming. So you need to know how to do that. So to know, to do that, this is the very last part, that you need what is called the R syslog. R syslog means, if you have in the DMZ, you saw how many machines are drawn there. Load balancer, this, firewall, IP table, if each of them is having logs, and you have to log into each machine, run scripts, collect the information, that, that's not good. What do you want? One machine, all these other machines should be doing their normal job. They should be reporting to this one guy, that's our syslog, remote syslog. He should be receiving all these messages and filing them and archiving them. So we want to look in one place using one set of tools, we want to archive logs, we want to generate alerts, we want to verify trends, and we want to do this with open source, so our sync. R syslog is the, is the uh, thing for this. And you can run it on a server and it can scale like anything. It can get one million messages a second and store it without any problem. On a normal x86 box, Intel box with uh, 2 GB RAM. You need a lot of hard disk of course and I'll show you that. 
and these are again syntax don't worry what to allow whom to allow which type of messages to accept from which ips to accept again security this is important that our proxy server i'll just explain these two things the template says store that in the log disk squid log files percent year means 2014 percent month means 05 and so on so forth and below that day squid access log day this is another template squid access log 407 means denied tcp denied filter those messages that's what this script is doing that is the log message says denied put it in a separate file if it says accept put it in another file we have two files why because there are so many denied messages we want to process them separately accept messages we want to process separately and we want to rotate why are we using the year month day and all time because we want to archive it for one year two years so are we doing don't worry about the exact syntax you can do this that you can go to one machine and in the log disk you can see there is a authen dhcp log there is imap log there's an ldap log there's a mail log for external there's a mail log for internal there's a mail log for outgoing smtp auth there's a squid log squid log is the proxy server log so let us go one more level in squid logs if you go further these are the type of files you see can you see the size of this file yesterday's third line from the top it is 5 gb compressed logs 5232841291 is the compressed log for 2014 may 17 this is not the denied logs the denied is the one with the 407 actually denied is bigger sorry denied is the one which is 5 gb and 1.3 uh, sorry the uh, yeah 158 mb is the non denied so what is denied mean your access control prevented that request from going and very often it is because the guy didn't authenticate very often most people have a virus or a worm in their machine and it tries to go out our proxy server and they bombard the proxy server so if i were to say i would analyze this why it is happening which machines it is happening virus infected remove it and so on so forth so this is the last slide in tomorrow's lab i told you ip stables and r syslog should can be done only by sysads who are controlling the entire network in a lab of yours you can set up an experiment you can ask your students to install all this but what we are going to ask you to do tomorrow and that's for tomorrow morning's lab is use two tools aw stats and ossec aw stats is for the centralized log analysis with a focus on security ossec is a real time reactive host intrusion detection system and here let me just tell something log analysis one thing what is integrity checking i am the mail server or i am the web server of iit bombay who is accessing me what data that is one type of information so if somebody corrupts my web page what is the meaning of corrupt my web page modifies by saying you know some bad things about me or adding more data or changing the file how will i know that's called integrity analysis so you need to know whether any of your important data or files have changed if it has changed is it an authorized change or unauthorized change that's called integrity md5 some hashing checking the file content similarly processes our processes that should never run on this machine are they running if this process ever runs let me know you can't remove that process but if it runs you should know okay so this is all ossec so i will stop here